We're going to continue now with Module 5. Uh, this is Module 5B, and we're going to look now at infectious causes of cancer. Okay. So the learning outcomes for this module, after watching this lecture and the second lecture that follows, you should be able to identify major infectious causes of cancer, identify mechanisms by which infectious organisms can cause cancer, and then be able to list and understand public health measures that may prevent cancers that have an infectious component. Okay, so we're going to start this first part and we're going to talk about human papillomavirus and, and cervical cancer. This is chapter 29 in your textbook. And then the second lecture um, that will follow this one will look at um, H. pylori infection and its association, its association with peptic ulcer and gastric cancer. And that corresponds to chapter 30 in your textbook. We'll now discuss human papillomavirus, or HPV, and cervical cancer. Showing the connection that HPV is actually responsible for causing cervical cancer was extremely important scientific work that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2008. This was awarded to Dr. Harold Zurhausen, and he was really responsible for the discovery of HPV and showing that this is the virus that results in cervical cancer. HPV, or human papillomavirus, is a DNA virus that's able to infect both human skin cells as well as the mucosal membranes. A lot of times, in many different strains of HPV can infect the skin and cause warts. Specific strains of HPV, which we'll talk about in a little while, are able to infect the mucosal membranes and can cause genital warts or ultimately lead to the development of cervical cancer. HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the U.S. About 79 million Americans are currently infected with HPV, and about 14 million people become newly infected each year. This is very startling, and this leads to the statistic or overwhelming um, idea that HPV is so common that most sexually active men and women will get at least one type of HPV at some point in their lives. And so the work that Harold Zerhausen did was showing that HPV is present in cervical cancer. And so when you look at this figure here, what it's showing is that if, when you take cervical cancer and you look for the presence of HPV, you see all of these different strains. So there's different subtypes of HPV. 70% of cervical cancers are found to be positive for HPV 16 and HPV 18. Um, today we know that there's about 100 different types of HPV present, about 40 are able to infect the genital tract. 15 of these, the ones that are shown here, put women at high risk for developing cervical cancer. Um, as well as HPV can lead to other types of cancer. Um, the important thing that was shown though is that if you look at cervical cancer, HPV can be detected in 99.7% of all cervical cancer. And so this is very striking, and it says that if you could prevent HPV infection or you had a way to treat it, you could ultimately prevent cervical cancer. Okay. And so how does HPV infection lead to cervical cancer? And so what happens is that HPV is able to infect epithelial cells and the cervical mucosal membrane. It's going to um, infect these cells and cause an initial infection. The virus will replicate, it will be actively growing, infecting cells, causing them to replicate the virus and spreading. Typically this initial infection will um, heal within two years. And so um, this might lead to the um, you might, might lead to uh, genital wards, it might not. So usually this initial infection goes undetected. Okay, what happens though is that um, after, it's established, after it's the initial infection, when it's in this lytic phase, it will enter into latency. And this means that the HPV DNA, so the entire DNA genome of the virus, will integrate into um, different cells in um, the cervix. And so over time, what can happen is that in about 0.8% of the time, it could cause um, a cell to become transformed into a cancerous cell. And so what you're seeing is that, you know, this initial event where HPV goes in, it infects a cervical um, mucosal cell, it causes initial infection, that's usually resolved within months, so about two to four months. This later event where the latent virus, which is now integrated into the DNA, um, when that actually causes that cell to become cancerous, that is a much, much longer process, so about 10 to 30 years before you would actually see it lead to the development of cancer.
And so, um, again, recall back to the initial lecture when we talked about the introduction of cancer. Um, what's happening is that this HPV is going to cause that cell to become transformed. You will have can abnormal cell growth that will grow and divide and ultimately could become malignant and spread outside of the cervix, causing very serious cancer to develop. Okay, and so one of the mechanisms by which HPV can directly cause um, a cell to become transformed into a cancerous cell is by messing with the normal checks that are in place in the cell cycle. So you're seeing on the left here the cell cycle where um, with the traditional um, G um, phases, interphase, as well as the M phase and S phase. And so um, before the cell will decide to divide, it will go through this G2 checkpoint. So it's really important at this point in the cell cycle that you know the cell is checking to make sure it's in a good state before it decides to grow and divide. And so one of the things that it's checking at this G2 checkpoint is, does my DNA look okay? Do I not have any sort of DNA mutations or DNA damage that would make it you know, um, not advantageous to divide right now? And so there is a particular protein called P53. It's known as a tumor suppressor protein because when P53 is functioning regularly, it's able to detect DNA damage and halt the cell cycle. So basically P53 will recognize that there's breaks in the DNA. It will sort of initiate a cascade of events that will stop cell division and those mutated cells will no longer grow and divide and the cervix will remain healthy. What happens though when HPV is present in some cases is that HPV is able to produce a particular protein that is an inhibitor of P53. So when HPV is present, it produces this inhibitor. Now P53 is not going to function normally in this G2 checkpoint. So there's going to be DNA present. Um, P53 is no longer able to detect that. The cell will think that everything's okay. It will start to initiate M phase. It will go on to grow and divide. And then now these mutant cells are going to start to grow uncontrollably because this P53 was now inactivated by a viral protein. It wasn't able to stop this process from occurring and you're going to have abnormal cell growth. And so we know that the prevalence of HPV infection is extremely high. The statistics tell us that almost every sexually active American is going to be infected with one type of HPV in their lifetime. And so how does infection with HPV correlate with cervical cancer prevalence? So if you can assume that HPV is worldwide, it's present everywhere, you see very high rates of infection, where does that actually lead to the development of cervical cancer? And you can see that rates of cervical cancer are quite low in areas like the US and Canada and certain portions of Europe as well as Northern Africa. Okay, um, Where you see cervical cancer rates much higher are going to be in South America, um, certain regions of Africa as well as in Russia. And so this means that they probably have lower rates of cerv early cervical cancer detection and screening in place and so that cervical cancer ultimately develops. The next thing that's important to look at is cervical cancer mortality rates. So we know that cervical cancer rates are going to vary worldwide, but in which regions do you see that cervical cancer actually leads to um, death? And this is important because cervical cancer can be detected early, it can be removed, it can be treated quite effectively. And you can see here that certain regions of Africa have much higher mortality rates when you compare it to just prevalence of cervical cancer. And so here you can see where is it best to intervene? Do we need to increase um, detecting cervical cancer um, earlier? As well as do we then need to um, sort of implement better treatment options, um, get treatment into certain regions? Okay, and so what's available? How can you go out and test for HPV? Okay, so it can be tested by taking a sample of cells and seeing if they contain either viral DNA viral DNA from the virus or the presence of RNA um, that would be transcribed in viral replication. And so there are tests that are approved um, by the FDA, so this is in America, for only two indications. One of these tests is follow-up testing of women who have an abnormal pap test. So pap smear is going to take some of those cervical cells um, and then they'll be looked at under a microscope to see is there any sort of abnormal cell growth. Do you see um, early incidences of 
um, transformation of cervical cells or development of cancer. And so once a pap test comes back um, negative or you know they see something, then they can order for an actual testing to see is HPV present? Can we detect viral DNA or RNA? Okay, um, as well as, so that's the first um, test that is approved. Um, the second one is going to be um, whether or not um, you have women over the age of 30. And this is important because before I told you that the initial HPV infection usually clears within two to four months. Once you then have that viral genome integrated into your cells, it can take decades before that can cause that cell to transform into a cancerous one. And so looking for the presence of HPV is only going to be quite, is only going to be more advantageous in women over the age of 30. So they've been sexually active for um, more than 10 years they are at higher risk now for developing cervical cancer. And so the FDA has approved tests to actually um, confirm whether or not HPV is present in these cells. Um, also, there's no, um, we know that both men and women can be infected with HPV, even though men won't develop cervical cancer. Um, it's good to know whether or not they are carriers for this, as well as um, HPV can cause different types of cancers in men. Um, but there currently is no test to screen for whether or not men um, are carriers for HPV. Um, and so it's really important we have effective ways of testing for HPV, um, but is there a way to prevent it? Now that science has shown that HPV is what causes cervical cancer, it would be best to prevent HPV infection in the first place. And so luckily what has been developed in the past few years is an HPV vaccine. So the first one came on the market in 2006, and this is Gardasil. Um, what it does is it prevents against um, four different specific strains of HPV. So remember, HPV 16 and HPV 18, those are the ones that you see in 70% of cervical cancer, as well as other two high-risk strains of HPV, 6 and 11. Okay, and so in 2006, it was approved for um, vaccines in females. The recommended age for females is about 11 to 12. So you really want to catch individuals before they become sexually active. Because HPV is so prevalent, once an individual becomes sexually active, they're at very high risk of getting infected. So you really want to catch children before they become sexually active. So about 11 to 12 is the recommended age. Women are also um, recommended to get vaccinated before before they reach 26. After that, it's not really indicated anymore since most sexually active women then would be assumed to be infected with HPV. In 2009, Gardasil was also um, also approved for um, vaccinations in boys. And so now boys 11 to 12 are also recommended to get the Gardasil vaccine um, before they become sexually active. Um, a second HPV vaccine was also approved in 2009. This was um, this is Severix. This is just against the, um, again, the most prevalent HPV strains that you see in cervical cancer, so subtypes 16 and 18. Um, and this one right now is only approved for females. Again, that 11 to 12 year old age range, and again, you want to get that vaccine before you turn 26.